a warm welcome to all of you. Um, I'm Gabriel from Thempra, and together with the Social Pedagogy Association, um, which is based in the US, and the Social Pedagogy Professional Association, which is based in the UK, um, we've been running a free webinar series on exploring social pedagogy concepts at turbulent times. The idea behind this is that obviously theory and practice need to engage with each other and develop alongside each other inter, um, in a way that's interconnected. Um, and so we thought it would be a good time during the COVID pandemic to actually re-examine what, what value does theory add to practice? How does it help us to understand what's going on and how we respond um, to, to the crisis? Um, and equally, what do we need to do to make sure that theoretical understandings are informed by what's actually happening in practice. Um, so this is, um, I think, the fourth version, uh, the fourth uh, series of this. Um, and today we'll be focusing on the relational universe and how we can strengthen relationships during the pandemic. I'm extremely delighted to be joined by Nicola Boyce from Lighthouse Children's Home and Krista Parsons from Lincolnshire County Council and I um, have to pass on apologies from Elaine Hamilton from Nella Johnson House, who was due to uh, join us as well, but is unfortunately um, out of action with a stomach bug. Um, so she sends her apologies, but she will be joining us for the next webinar um, on the Learning Zone model. Um, so if you miss her, then join in next time. Um, also, just to say that um, this webinar is recorded, um, so we'll be recording it in speaker's view, which means if you're not speaking, then your picture shouldn't be there. Um, so if you want to contribute later on, just be mindful if you don't want your video to be on the, on the recording, then just switch off your camera before you talk. Um, but otherwise, hopefully, you'll be quite happy to be um, videoed as well if that's okay. Um, if you have any concerns, just let us know through the chat, send me an individual chat message, and I'll make sure that um, I, I screen the video before it goes public at some point uh, later this year. Um, so if people are happy with this so far, I will just make a start, um, give you a quick outline of the webinar, um, which is essentially um, quite straightforward. Um, I'll give you a quick outline of the relational universe in a moment, um, and then we'll have a, a fishbowl discussion with Nicola and Krista to begin with. Uh, so we'll hear a little bit about sort of their experiences around using the relational universe um, and how it can be applied. And then we'll have a wider exploration of the relational universe with you all. So that's a good opportunity for you guys to kind of join in the fishbowl and um, contribute with your experience and insights. Um, and towards the end, we'll try and draw out key learning points for practice so that we can make sure that that's kind of captured as well. Okay, so the relational universe is essentially a metaphor that we've developed in order to kind of outline how we want to think about relationships in social pedagogy. Um, and the importance um, kind of being that it is about looking at interdependence and recognizing that we're all connected to other people. We all have a whole number of different relationships with people um, out there, whether that's friends or um, family members, um, peers, relationships that we have with other people in the community, whether these are neighbors or the, the local choir or the local church or the football club or whatever. Um, and we've also potentially got relationships with um, professionals um, that might be supporting us in our lives at different stages or on an ongoing basis. Um, so the relational universe tries to kind of visually chart those relationships um, and kind of suggest that they are a little bit like planets. So there are different constellations in our lives and some planets are big um, because those relationships are important to us. Some planets have a strong gravitational pull on us because they're important to us or because they're quite powerful. Um, and some are less so. There might be a black hole that seems to kind of not be so visible, but suck up a lot of energy if you want. Um, there might be distant stars that, that are no longer really there, but still have a presence um, in our lives. 
so all of these things are um, interesting to kind of observe of how they, yeah, how they're kind of happening in people's um, lives. And um, as a visual kind of metaphor, it gives us an opportunity to really better understand what is the power of different relationships um, and how can we actually strengthen relationships um, to create a greater sense of equilibrium. In a professional understanding, it is really about what can we do to help people have the skills to recognize which relationships are detrimental, which relationships cost them a lot of energy or, you know, are emotionally um, challenging for them and which relationships um, perhaps are more uplifting, uh, are the ones that give them strength rather than drain them and those kinds of things. So we want people to kind of be able to, to develop those relationships and to, to have a better understanding of what is going on around relationships, who they can trust, who they might, um, who they might uh, be better off not trusting and all of that. Um, I think the important bit is that as professionals, we don't get to decide who is in someone's relational universe. Um, and that's really important because it means that um, we, as professionals, obviously we're asked to make professional judgments, but we also need to be careful not to be judgmental in how we think about relationships and how we assume they must, a, a person must feel about their relational universe. So to give you an example, just very briefly, I've charted the relationship, uh, relational universe of a lady called Rachel, um, who, whose relational universe looks like this. So she has a son um, who is very much at the heart of her relationship, uh, her relational universe here. Um, and she has a partner who's kind of here a little bit more on the outskirts. Um, and diametrically opposed because he kind of pulls her a little bit in an opposite direction to, to where her son is pulling her. Interestingly, Rachel has put herself as a rather small planet versus, you know, her son being kind of the, the heart of the relational universe for her. Um, and a lot of that is because her, her son has a learning disability, so he needs quite a lot of support from her. Um, there are some professionals in their lives because of that, but Rachel doesn't really have that much of a relationship with them, um, even though they're kind of there. Um, Rachel also has some friends that, that are really supportive of her, um, and a lot of them uh, kind of have kids with disabilities as well. So many of those friends she knows through her son. Um, and she also has a neighbor that's very close to her. And that's pretty much what we know about Rachel's relational universe. We also know that her parents are deceased, so they're a bit more like distant stars somewhere, still present, still obviously having an influence on her life. Um, but as professionals, we don't know much more about that. And it could be that Rachel is very happy with her relational universe. It could be that she's very, very unhappy about it. Um, so for us as professionals, charting the relational universe gives us an opportunity to kind of talk and ask curious questions about so what is going on in these relationships can you tell me a little bit more about this and that and the other and i think it also shows that um by gaining those insights we can then help kind of look at okay so rachel how would you like your relational universe to look like in the future and to be a bit more future-minded be a bit more hopeful and showing that we can, we're actually there to support people in strengthening the relationships. Just because you might have a difficult relationship with your partner um, doesn't mean that that has to stay like that, you know, and it doesn't mean that you need to go search for a new partner. It is all about how, what can we do from where things are at with the understanding of your life world, of what your relational universe looks like and where you might want it what you might want it to look like in the future. What can we do to kind of help you move a little bit more towards that? Um, so at this point, I will just stop the screen share and um, invite Krista to share a little bit more about how you've been using the relational universe in your work at, um, at Lincolnshire County Council. Thanks, morning everyone. 
and um, I've just now been blinded by the sun so sorry if I'm squinting at you but <laughs> anyway at least the sun's shining so that's a good thing um I was just actually while you were talking it just uh, occurred to me actually when that I think about um my my role at Lincolnshire is um, I'm the Caring to Learn manager and Caring to Learn is a sort of initiative that's grown up over the last uh, almost three years now um, about um, and it was really about how to improve a lot uh, a wide range of outcomes for our looked after children and um, and actually when we sat and thought about it in the beginning and we did a lot of work with um, uh, with Claire Cameron from UCL and um, and um, and some of the people, it was about that interchange of relationships between the different groups working um, with the children at the centre. And um, I, we came up with this uh, sort of, again, a, a sort of, um, um, idea that, you know, we had the children to the centre and it was all to do with the, uh, the success of, of whether the, those outcomes for those children were, were good, really depended on the relationships of the three main kind of, areas within that universe I suppose is how I'm defining it now between you know their sort of home um, and that could be any the home in any sense really the where the who they're living with currently or their, their birth family their home where they see as their home services and all the professionals involved in that and also you know the school and how those three groups of people really um, interact with each other and um, and how they, you know, how their relationships impact on what the outcomes for the children. So actually, I just, I didn't mention that earlier, Gabriel, but it just came to me as you were talking, really, I think actually that is, you know, the key of how we wanted to work. So, um, yeah, I suppose thinking about that wide, you know, growing from what's, the, you know, the centre of the child's universe outwards. And interestingly, I did um, talk to one of our residential workers about, a, you know, a piece of work that she did, a piece of direct, direct work she did with the child. Um, trying to get her to really think about this idea of, um, um, of her relationships and her relational universe and she did find it very difficult um, and she really wanted to focus on the present aspect of that and who were who were her main uh, relationships there and it was about who the residential workers who she saw as really uh, you know her, her key and her rock at the moment um, about the, her teachers and at school who she really um, felt did care for her and and were really doing a lot for her because they were preparing her for a future um, and her social worker who um, thankfully she'd had a, a you know stable social worker she'd been in touch with for quite a few years and she, you know and those were the three people three the two groups of people and and one individual that she identified and those um but when uh, the worker tried to expand that out and talk about perhaps people from um in her wider universe like her birth family her mom her dad um you know very difficult relationships there she was only having a uh, letterbox contact uh, with mom because of neglect and trauma and things like that so but she just didn't even want to include them in her universe at all she said no i've moved on from them and she was very firm in the way she described them um, and that, but then thinking about the future, she said, you know, talking about who will remain in your universe, do you think in the future, who will be there? And she said, what about when, you know, if you change, when you leave school or when you move on or when workers from the residential home leave or move on? Um, it kind of opened up this idea that, to show that her attachments weren't really that strong because she said, oh, well, some, some new people will come along and they'll, and I'll meet new teachers or there'll be new workers and then they'll help me. And so that was, I just thought that was a really interesting insight how you talking in this way about the different relationships really opened up where that child was at at the moment. Um, and, and, um, and where probably, you know, you could go on to develop her relationships further or, or at least explore where those relationships could be. And she did um, a, a bit of creative work to show that, to sort of, uh, she didn't do it in um, uh, with the planets, unfortunately. But they did have some people uh, dolls, and um, where they would, how she would represent it like that. And uh, and interestingly, this lady here, that's that is uh, Jenny with the. I think it's supposed to be read her. She's that's her social worker, but she's the only actual individual she identified as being important to her in her universe. And the other two were, were kind of 
generic groups, the people with the feathers, that, those are the res residential workers, and the, um, the fluffy sort of dress people, they, these were her teachers. So she didn't even go on to sort of represent individual people who she had a strong bond with. And I, and I think that, again, really demonstrated that perhaps she didn't have those really close and strong bonds with people in her immediate universe, and that was something obviously she would want to work on. So that's a bit of stuff about individual work. And I just want to quickly mention, you can cut me off again, really, I'm talking too much, but, um, you know, some of the other stuff we've had to think of with COVID about, um, as part of how we work um, at Caring to Learn, because, you know, everything was about um, building those relationships across teams and across uh, groups of people, uh, supporting foster carers, supporting residential, um, supporting schools as well, particularly. And um, and obviously we kind of had that removed from us. I was saying we, you know, we were um, we were a small team, but we were flying about the county, visiting schools, visiting, you know, for the last couple of years, and then that was gone. We were doing lots of face-to-face -face training, and again we had to rethink that and how we would do that and make that relationship still strong at the centre of it. But actually, it has been an opportunity for us because um, people have really craved relationships that you know. Uh, and, and meaningful kind of connections with people. So we had a Facebook group, for instance, that we'd started over um, a couple of years ago, and that was growing slowly. But um, from April, we've had nearly 300 new members of that. And so it's grown massively just in a few months because people want to connect with that. We, we started some WhatsApp groups, for, for instance, a listening group for our experienced foster carers. Um, we were asked if we could start one for our... Um, newest foster carers and those going through assessments with and they've grown we've now been asked for one for permanent carers because they're and they're so active you know people are looking for different ways to uh, to connect to support each other and then also thinking about how we proactively supported people to build relationships so just by not having um all formal meetings everything's over zoom over through a screen isn't it and how do you really connect through that but how we can do that socially and um and informally and so having social meetings um we you know just last uh, tuesday evening we played um we had a quiz and and pictionary with uh, i was so with um, a group of foster carers just a, a fun social evening we're doing that once a fortnight now um you know we don't talk about anything um work or professional related it's just purely a, a fun activity and we've built more of those kinds of things and so again really having to think how do we keep those relationships that people are craving and the connections that people need to support them through this difficult time um, and how we proactively kind of address that. Thanks Krista, that's, that's really awesome, awesome to, to hear more about and uh, yeah I, I love the, the kind of way you guys have adapted to, yeah, to those challenges particularly around yeah just not being able to physically meet up necessarily. Um, and it's, it's good to hear that it's been taken up so much. Um, thanks very much for that. I think it's, it's also great insight into how you, can, how you can adapt and vary the metaphor when you use it in practice, particularly with young people who might have completely different ideas of how to turn this into a creative um, activity that speaks more to them um, and hopefully gives us, gives us some insights into where they're at in terms of their relationships. Um, and I think it's, it's fascinating sort of uh, watching that um, and your, your kind of story about how she represented groups rather than individuals. Um, and I think, again, it's that point about, you know, maybe that's okay. It represents where she's at at that moment in time. It doesn't mean that she'll always think about relationships in that way. Um, and it doesn't mean that we necessarily have to judge her based on that. Maybe it's just okay to work with that. It gives us an insight into where she's at and that's that's what's crucial. Um, so thanks for that. I'll hand over to Nicola at this point, um, who's been using the relationship, uh, the relational universe at Lighthouse in a very interesting way as well. Thanks, Gabriel. I was, that was lovely actually hearing about that work with that child. I wanted to think a bit more about uh, expanding where you can use the relational universe conceptually. Um, so I'm director of practice for Lighthouse Children's Homes and we're working towards the opening of our first home next year and so not doing direct work with children 
in our organisation at the moment, but thinking about the relational universe in terms of organisation and using it at a more strategic level. So instead of just approaching the kinds of contacts that we need to make with other agencies and services and setting up a children's home as a kind of tick list of instrumental compliance requirements, actually thinking about what, what are the kinds of relationships that we want to build as a relational universe around the home. You know, I'm really thinking about that. If you, if you believe the notion that it takes a village to raise a child and that what all children need is a sense of belonging that's, that's grounded a bit in place, in a sense of community. One of the reasons we wanted to open a home in London is because London is so un underserved for children's homes. So a lot of London kids get sent a hell of a long way outside of London, hundreds of miles up the country. And an awful lot of the feedback from those young people is how much they not only feel um, the loss of their immediate, really enormously important relationships, so the kind of the equivalent of the of the planet of the Rachel Sun in the image that Gabriel showed at the beginning. So it's not just about their family, but actually, if you've if you've grown up in uh, part of North London and you're from Islington and you find yourself several hundred miles away in North Yorkshire, that real feeling of being ripped out of your community and a sense of place and the kind of rejection and loss that goes with that. So we wanted to think about what relational universe do we grow around this home so that these kids can have a sense of belonging because we want to offer places to kids from London so that they are able to keep in touch with where they're from and the people not just in their family but in their school and their friends and other networks. Um, and what's needed for that because the reality is that very often uh, Chris and I were just talking before we started. It's, it's a very common story that opening a new children's home starts with opposition from the neighbours and objection to planning applications. And we do seem to have a bit of a split in our minds in this country between um, the way that we talk about uh, our own children or all children and the difference when you start to talk about kids in care or kids who really struggled, have got some real challenges in their lives and who may express that through being quite challenging with the people around them at times and we seem to get a lot more judgmental and a lot less welcoming at that point and I know from a lot of work that I've done with young people in care they really keenly feel that and they talk about the sense of feeling rejected by the local community that the neighbours are looking at them and judging them that they've also been rejected by school that they got kicked out of youth club that you know they got kicked out of the scouts for so it really compounds it so what we've been doing at Lighthouse is we've been thinking about how we grow the relational universe through developing real relationships with our neighbours, with other agencies in the local area and needing to do that by meeting with them more than one way. So we took the opportunity before we got into tier two restrictions in London of holding some uh, socially, well, physically distanced, but hopefully socially connected meetings with our neighbours in the local park because we knew that from doing door knocking and going round, a number of our neighbours are really quite elderly and they're not that comfortable on platforms like this. They're not that Zoom savvy. A number of them were like, well, I can do that when my granddaughter's round, but the rest of the time, there's no point talking to me about Zoom or sending me a link. So we did some online meetings, but we did some in-person ones and we did find we were talking to different people. And instead of just doing a kind of tell and sell of a new children's home is opening, here's the information, here's how you can make a complaint um, and here are the timescales. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to ask them about what they felt about it, what they would hope our children's home would be like and what their concerns were. So we've already entered into some real conversations. Some of them are quite simple things to sort out, like you've got, you've just bought that building, there's a really overgrown hedge. Um, it'd be great if you could prioritise trimming that because it's obstructing the pavement, things like that, to bigger concerns about who are the children and what will their behaviour be like. And by being able to talk to them about that and that we want to offer placements to kids who are from the local area, we've been met with an awful lot of positive response. And because we've not limited it to, let us tell you about what we've got planned. We've been asking about those people and every time we've met with people locally, and this includes with other agencies and with contractors to work on the building, we've been asking them about whether they would like to get involved in supporting us in any way or volunteering, taking that notion of, there are all these rich talents and possibilities and part of the, the meaningfulness and value of relationships is that things emerge, don't they, that you wouldn't have expected when you get to know people and things that you never could have planned for come about. And I know over the years, for example, 
that uh, I've had many tricky situations with neighbours with children's homes when we've had some difficulties with the young people. But as soon as the kids and the neighbours have been able to actually meet each other, the increase in trust and the decrease in kind of suspicion of you mean me harm in some way or you wish me gone suddenly shifts enormously and those neighbours start to offer stuff. And I found the same thing before we've even got children in with Lighthouse in that by asking neighbours, is there any way that you could help or support us or want to volunteer? I've got people who've offered to come and help with the garden, who would like to bring around their dog a couple of times a week to just hang out with the children if the kids would like that, who um, have said, well, not me, but my mum has done fostering for years and I know she'd be more than happy to talk to you about how she could support the home or, well, I not myself, I'm very busy, but I'm happy to do some fundraising for you, for example. Uh, to really practical uh, kind of, I'd be happy to come and get enjoyed, uh, join in doing some volunteering to do direct work with the kids. We've extended that even to things like planning for how we do building works. So instead of just looking for any contractor who can offer us a cheap price, we've looked for local contractors because we want to invest in the local community. And if we can make an economic contribution, but get to know local traders who then know the building, who are then available and understand why it matters so much to come out and do a quick repair at three o'clock in the morning and they've already got the information about what kind of windows we've got. I know from experience that that very often brings offers and the same has been true again that we've had some of those contractors saying oh well look I'll um, I will happily offer work experience placements uh, for your kids in the future if any of them are interested in learning about building or plumbing or you know, even the guy who came out because he's local to do uh, our fire risk assessment inspection said, well, if you're going to need training for your staff team, I'd be happy to do that heavily discounted and offer free training so the kids can get a qualification if any of them want to do that, if they're getting on to vocational courses in sixth form college. And I think it's been really, it's been really heartening to see that by extending that notion of what's the web of relationships, the universe that you're creating, in a, in a whole local community around a home to think about how it's not just that one immediate team of carers who are then responsible for those children, but that you can really draw out all the talents and strengths of what local people might want to offer, but would never know to do so if they don't know that you're there or that there's a role for them or that they're welcome or that the door is open. So I just wanted to offer that as a, a way of extending the idea of what do we mean? Because I think you know, this is the truth we know at a large scale from every child protection investigation nationally there's ever been. It comes down to the quality of relationships between professionals and agencies, as much as the focus on relationships for children and families in direct practice. Thanks very much, Nicola. That's really fascinating. And um, I think it shows a really thoughtful approach to how you can already kind of cultivate not just the the universe of the children that you'll be supporting but actually you know as an organization your your collective relational universes uh, will kind of benefit from that um and i think it's fascinating because when we talk about um sort of what what contribution can we make to the relational universes of in this case children in care i think by by having laid those um that that kind of groundwork of where we're actually trying to to take a real community approach you you're just creating so many more opportunities for their relational universe to really thrive and for them to get a different experience of what it's like to live in a community and to be part of a community and to have that sense of meaningful belonging that that we all crave so that's just really really radical um really fantastic um, so I'm, I'm very curious about um, any other sort of examples that any of you might have or any thoughts um, on what we've talked about so far. So feel free to just unmute yourselves and um, basically join the fishbowl for the want of a better word. I know that Ian's already been adding some, some thoughts there. Um, so feel free to unmute yourself. Tell us a little bit more about it. Okay, we'll go with Karen first. Um, she was quick on the unmute button. <laughs> um, yeah, 
but um that, thank you both for that there was really really interesting um examples um i'm a lecturer at, uh, at uclan and um but my background was social work working with adults and older people and i could really see how um those examples could be um transferred to working with um, older people and particularly nicola when we're thinking about old people moving into residential or nursing care often they might be taken out of their communities so that sort of way of working and bringing the community in and helping people to feel part of that community could be really valuable in that way thanks karen uh simon you had your hand up as well simon taylor um, yes thank you um I will eventually be able to unmute myself swiftly one day. Um, uh, I, 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 Chris and Nicole, uh, Nicola, sorry, thank you. Um, uh, really interesting examples. Um, I just want to reflect on, we recently um, established a new home here in Derbyshire. It's been up and running for probably just over a year now. Um, and uh, the group of staff there took that similar approach that Nicole, Nicola was describing in, in the sense of trying to make links to the community and found it really quite difficult. One of the things we did on the development day, however, was, um, uh, this was even before the home had opened, we set up a, a treasure hunt, which had to go out into the community and it, groups of the members of the staff had to go and talk to people within different shops, within different settings, within different community organisations, gather bits of information, thread that back together and come back together at a, a local um, pub. And um, uh, in a sense, uh, that gave both the staff a real view of the community but also started lots of individual conversations and interestingly one of those conversations was with um, a, a local uh, care home and actually they provided some voluntary experience to one of the children that eventually came to that home of going in to work in that care home with elderly frail um, which uh, gave that child confidence a different view of the world a different way of thinking about themselves as a contributor I don't think that could have been set up from scratch had those initial conversations not worked. Um, so it was just a bit of a thread that we'd had a lot of success with that, but it, it, it's a tricky one to overcome those. But it's, yeah, just a, a share from our side of things. Yeah. Thanks very much. And I think there's, there's an import, important point here in that interdependence does not mean that you're the only one that's reliant on others but it also means that you have a meaningful contribution to make. So being able to kind of give that young person an opportunity to, to feel like they're really making a contribution, they're really a valued part in their local community and in that care home in particular is just really crucial. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Okay, Robin. Also not very swift there, Simon. Um, <laughs> Yeah, thanks to Krista and Nicola. Um, great stuff there. It, what was in my mind, um, had my, my background before I met social pedagogy was social work, and I've just come out of a, a couple of years in a local authority. Um, and what a lot of social workers use, often not terribly well, but um, is, is an eco map. And, and the thing about the relational universe for me versus um, a kind of in an eco map kind of approach is the power of metaphor and Krista it really came out in those those dolls that you showed us just there that how much more can we get out of um, a, more understanding can we get from a from a person or a situation with the power of metaphor and um, I just wanted to add that one in because I think perhaps if we took more of a a relational universe approach, those eco maps would be uh, something much more tangible, much more um, uh, relational in, in the doing of them uh, for, for social workers to be able to understand who is significant. Because uh, an eco map, for those who don't know, shows um, sort of the generation, the, the, the family structure, and to some extent how, how strong weak or dangerous those relationships are but it's all it's all quite binary and uh, uh and and it's quite a painful process for families to go through actually um whereas this is for me uh, in the way that you both described it is is a much more nurturing and um uh uh sensitive 
approach to finding out what's going on in somebody's universe and, and how they would like it to look in the future. So thank you, great stuff. Thanks Robin. Um, that, that's a valuable point um, that you've brought in. And I think there, there's something as well about um, the, the relational universe and the use of metaphor can, can help us perhaps make contextual decisions that, that aren't just like, ooh, actually that uncle is an alcoholic and therefore they are going to be a negative influence and we'll make sure that there's no contact between that young person and their uncle when actually that uncle may well be an alcoholic and so are many people, so are many people that keep their lives together. Um, lots of people stop being an alcoholic um, and also you know, they might not be the best place for a young person to, to stay over the weekend, um, but they might be perfect for fixing a light bulb or things like that. So it's about how can we make contextual situated judgments and, and help continue to grow those relationships. And perhaps that young person might be the reason why they give, al uh, give up alcohol. Who knows? Um, so it's, it's that bit about how can we make sure that we give, give everybody a chance to be their best selves. So let's see then. Um, anybody else have any sort of... I just um, wanted to mention something that I mentioned before when Nicola was talking to us earlier before the meeting about how to expand on that um, uh, relationships. We, we were, but almost by accident, we were able to put um, a, a, a teenager in one of our residential homes back in touch with um, a foster carer who he lived with for two years um, previously, but, uh, you know, had quite a, a bad breakdown really at the end and, and he was moved um, from there to um, uh, to residential where he, he he's lived, you know, really successfully and really happily and he's in a much different place now, I think. And um, But it, because we work with supporting foster carers as well as um, being involved with some residential homes, um, Rebecca, who is my colleague in my team, she realised that uh, this boy um, had links with a foster care she was supporting currently, and 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 it was just to say by accident that sh uh, she um, had talked about this boy and and about how she regretted it. You know, not uh, she almost felt like she gave up on him, or she couldn't carry on, and those kinds of feelings that a lot of foster carers have when uh, they get to a really challenging point. But um, and um, and actually, they've been put back in touch with each other now, and they're having some contact, some communication, with a view to hopefully in the future meeting up and perhaps you know having um, going out for lunch or something like that, and to build those future relationships there. Because often we see when things are broken down, that's the end of it, isn't it? And they they don't have further contact. And and I think possibly, again, not that we did, but I can kind of envisage a, a you know a better scenario where perhaps someone had expanded on that relational universe um, and he might have expressed thoughts about wanting to see this lady again and wanting to build that relationship back up again. And then that being done proactively and purposefully rather than accidentally. I mean, it's still a good outcome, but that's made us think actually, how can we do that more proactively instead of saying, oh, those uh, relationships are written off or that was a bad experience for both and it's finished and, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, or what we come across all too often is like, oh, in order for that young person to settle in well in their new placement, they need to cut off all ties with with previous placements and previous foster carers, um, as if one relationship needs to replace the other in in exact in exact ways. Um, and if you think about, it, we we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't say like, oh, actually, yeah, I'm happy for you to be my friend now, but that means I'll you can no longer be my friend because don't have enough space in that for that in my life or stuff like that so it's yeah it's it's really crucial that we we think about what can we do to kind of help young people kind of not just feel like they've been abandoned in that respect i think there's a couple of themes coming through there that help to illustrate why is the relational universe so valuable as a concept and the way that it can just a different metaphor can shift um, some things that were kind of implicitly there that Robin was gesturing at with eco maps and social work practice, but it's a different angle on it. Because if you understand that your role is to grow the child's relational universe, 
rather than to become the most important planet in their system. I think it repositions the ego of workers. And at the moment, I think too often we've got to focus on uh, the most important relationship being the one between a child and a practitioner, despite the evidence about actually at best you might be there for a few years with them but you're not gonna replace that universe that already existed around them, that they came in with, even if like the child that Krista was talking about, that's a very painful and difficult set of relationships. But there's a bit that I kept hearing in, in what different people were saying there about, there's a paradox in an awful lot of social work and social care practice about our underdeveloped capacity to talk about repair in relationships. Because what Gabriel was talking about with that idea of what well, we're, we're ending all contact with that former carer because you need to move and settle into this new placement. I mean, there's no evidence based to it. I can't, I can't think of a, a scrap um, in social work that would say that was a good thing for children. And yet it is practiced so common that I encounter it more frequently than not. But if we really think about attachment theory, and if we think about the cycle of rupture and repair as being the substance of what relationships are, that's what we do constantly with our own closest relationships. You don't argue with your family or your partner or your kids and then move out and they never darken your bath towels again. You go back and work out how you're gonna make some kind of repair. And if we're not helping children who are growing up in the public care system to learn that through what we role model, how can they possibly develop sustainable relationships so that they can live interdependently and get help when they need it in the future as adults when we're not part of their lives but it requires maybe a bit of courage about us to go beyond some very simplistic is this a positive relationship because if so there'll never be any rupture there'll never be any tension that doesn't describe a relationship i've ever had yeah absolutely nicola and i think in in that sense there there is something about when when we have relationships that can carry us through through dark days then it's also okay for us to have relationships that kind of are tough and difficult and all of that. So I think it's, it's again, comes back to that bit about how can we create an equilibrium within that ever evolving relational universe, because all of those planets move. Um, and we all have relationships that, um, yeah, that, that maybe just weigh us down or where, you know, where we've experienced trauma, or we've gone through, through experiences together that have strengthened us or, or whatever. We all have so many different types of relationships and we actually need them because they help us grow, they help us learn, they help us reflect. Um, and I think, yeah, as, as you say, what we don't do uh, as individuals um, is we don't just go like, okay, I'll just cut those people out of my life completely. Because, you know, even if we might physically do that, they're still there, that, that presence is still there so that's the bit i think you you alluded to you can't just as a professional decide oh actually that person's no good and we'll just sever any links between them and the person we're supporting because their their gravitational pull might still be there and we might have just made it even stronger by virtue of trying to cut them out Great. I'm interested in maybe any examples any of you might have from um, adult social care practice um, in particular, because it's clearly not just a model that, that applies to, to children, young people. Um, and I'm curious to, to have any sort of examples. Karen, you already started to, to mention it earlier, but I also know that, Kath, you guys are, are very good, very adept in kind of helping people build relational universes in that sense um, through community circles. Yeah, I was just reflecting um, when everybody was sharing the thoughts. We use a tool called um, a relationship map. But when I think about the relational universe, the map that we use, it can, it depends how it's used, but it can be really like quite two dimensional where we record, yeah, who's in somebody's life and we think about the depth of the relationship. But I think when you look at the, doing it as a, like a solar system and you can see the depth, uh, the example you shared before when the son was very much at the center, but maybe the relationship with a the partner, there was a tug the other way. I don't know whether our relationship not quite gets the depth um, and the three-dimensional effect 
of what how we could yeah share that in a bit of a deeper way and add those layers of depth and complexity so that's given definitely give me something to think about from this morning just how we yeah share that in a way that the depth of relationships can come through rather than it just being a two-dimensional document that just has the names of people yeah definitely something to think about brilliant yeah Thanks very much. And I think it, it comes back to when you introduce metaphors, as Robin was saying earlier, it gives you something to, to explore that, that adds new, new dimensions to it. And you can, you can ask questions like, oh, so tell me something more about that constellation, where that partner is. Um, and you can, you know, play around um, in a way that's non-judgmental. Um, Great, thanks. So, um, have we got any other thoughts, comments, ideas, examples? I'll, I'll throw in another thought, um, something that's just, uh, I've been doing a bit of work with a colleague um, who leads our live story work um, training. Uh, basically, I'm there just to work the tech because they're not very good at that. Um, but in engaging with that material, a lot of what we've talked about is that sort of uh, particularly from, I move back to children again, because it's my space, but um, a lot of that work that goes in often far too late in the day around life story work uh, could be held by a lot of this understanding of the relational space around children as we go. Um, and it's not, I mean, in a sense, that's what life story work should be doing. It should be ongoing, but often it's, it's drawn together at moments when things are transitioning, things are changing. Uh, rather than it being done consistently. Um, and my feeling is if you could tie this understanding of relational space. Um, one of the activities we do on that is um, uh, as part of the direct work stuff is do a button tree. People may have done them. You draw a tree and you stick buttons, coloured buttons on them. Um, and that again has that space of holding it as a, a bit of a metaphor. You have different shapes, colours for different people. And each of those times and spaces can just put you in a, a different place of thinking. Um, but um, yeah, I watched a really interesting, I'm for desperately can't remember the name of the chat, but Magnus someone um, who did a lecture linking social pedagogy ideas with um, uh, life story work ideas, um, which was uh, um, a really interesting watch. I mean, I was only watching as a bit of a sort of academic exercise for that training. But if I can find it, I'll put it in the chat before I go. I'll put a link to it if I find it. Brilliant. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Simon. I, I was just going to say that I, I think there's a moment of opportunity this year as well, given that relationships and, and how we sustain them in the face of the restrictions as a result of the pandemic has been um, like so dominant uh, for all of us this year. I think that part of the frustration about what we can't do means that there's an appetite for people to figure out different ways of connecting and a different a different maybe more contemplative awareness of what's the value of that so i think that creates space for all of our services whether it's children's services or adult services to think about how much that matters and there's been so many examples of what communities will do if they know there's a need and you just ask and create the structures um, so i think it's really interesting to me because because i work primarily with children uh, to think about that in terms of contextual safeguarding um, but i think it's just as relevant uh, for particularly older people's services, that kind of part of what makes it safe in your context, in your neighbourhood where you live, is enough connection for the guy who works in your local shop or runs the local taxi service to have some connection with who are those older vulnerable people or vulnerable kids in the area and what part do they play in creating a community where they know how to make that safer and who to talk to if they've got a concern about something. And that I think that there's a lot of people who want to do that kind of thing, but where the kind of dominant notions of kind of, this is where we draw the line with service delivery is kind of quite a discrete instrumental task, overlooks the important, importance of that in terms of contextual safeguarding. It's a relational model within a place and a community that helps make all the people that live there potentially safer. And then how do we bring it from what Krista was saying as um, something where it's uh, a nice to have when you get to it, but somehow the focus wasn't directly on growing that in the first place to know that is our job. That is what the work is. Yeah, absolutely. 
And I think it, it's interesting because you're, you're kind of mentioning the pandemic and uh, the renewed focus, I think, or renewed awareness of just how important relationships are and how important the, the community is in supporting each other. Um, I wonder if anyone else has any further thoughts on like particularly the relevance of the pandemic for something like the relational universe, what it means. Well, and then I'll talk again because nobody else is. Um, but, but my only quick thought on that is um, uh, being now veritably middle aged, I don't know how to do it. I'm not sure I can figure out the solutions how to be in a relational space yet. However, I'm sort of the, the few connections I have in my job with actual children, uh, they seem to have better ideas about this than I do. Uh, I'm not saying they have all the solutions and I'm not saying they knit it together for me, my generation or my dad's generation, but they certainly have ways of thinking about the world that I haven't. Um, and that gives me hope that uh, maybe uh, I need some reverse pedagogy. Is that a thing uh, where actually I'm doing more of the learning in those situations? Because uh, I don't know as yet. That's all I had to offer. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a brilliant point. Um, absolutely. Um, young people can teach us a lot. Um, Ian, I know you've kind of been chatting away and I'm sorry, I've not kept much of an eye on, on the chat, but can, can we come back to you just now? Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, some great examples. Thank you, Christopher and Nicola. Um, just I mean, more recently, uh, obviously teaching, lecturing um, with the COVID situation and students being on campus, um, again, being a personal tutee for year one students has been quite a, a challenging situation, I have to say. So, so what I've been experiencing is, uh, is actually with individual students, they're having to reevaluate who their support networks are. So whereas previously, you know, they could uh, at certain times go back home and backwards and forwards and we'll have a circle of friends and new friends. I've actually seen them reevaluating who their networks are and having to look at others where they wouldn't necessarily draw upon. And I've almost seen a kind of a, a, a connectedness with like peer groups become stronger. Um, people in the same, uh, say, the same flat or, or the shared home have become much more important to them. And so the relational, relational universe for me as a, as a kind of a personal duty has seen, you know, whereas in the past it may a little bit be a little bit more um, relaxed, a little bit more, I've got more, I've got a wider network. It yeah. almost seems like the network's widened, but then particular aspects of it have become much more focused for them. And I don't know if that makes sense, but um, yeah. it, it, I think it's just watching it really, watching the changes. Um, whereas lots of students who talk about friends, new friends, and then family, some of those, um, I suppose, aspects have changed to others which I wouldn't necessarily have thought of. Um, but I think going back to the examples, yeah, and I almost see the relational universe as an organic um, experience and real life change. And, and, and that's why I like it for as a metaphor. And I think, yeah, metaphors are important whether you're a child or an adult, because, you know, who, it's not for us to say who's important to that individual. It's for them to, you know, to decide that. And like Krista says about, you know, the, 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 the young person who went back to the foster care, to me, that to me is just a prime example of, you know, things change and organically move. And or it might be over years, but actually, if it's still important to them, it's important to them. And I don't think we're in a position to go, well, you can't, you can't not see that person. Um, yeah, so I think it's interesting, again, you know, I mean, again, my background's working with children, um, but actually I've always tried to enable the child to have the voice, but I think, like many of have said, it's difficult sometimes in, an, in, an, in organisations where the structures are quite binary and quite kind of stagnant, where it, once it's decided this is what's, what's happening to the child, it kind of stays there rather than organically changing. So I think this is an interesting um, tool that could be used. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ian. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, at this point, it would be great if uh, you all could use the last couple of moments to just uh, post any kind of key learning points from, from this session on the relational universe. Um, whilst I will just keep talking because I just want to pick up one point that, that Ian just made. Um, and I think that that is very much about 
perhaps there's an opportunity for us, given that the pandemic has really kind of upended many people's relational universes in terms of who we can see, how we communicate with them, how we keep in touch. Um, and, you know, offered opportunities perhaps as well to, to build new relationships and repro, you know, reframe, as you said, Ian, about who can I really kind of rely on because they're physically close to me or I can keep easy contacts to. So I think perhaps it, there, there is an opportunity not to kind of replace people again in that relational universe. So if we manage to keep our existing relationships growing and somehow evolving at these tough times, be it through Zoom or through the traditional phone calls, rather than the kind of weekly coffee morning um, or dinner or whatever it might be, then there's an opportunity for us to still expand our relational universe because we're being forced to add new relationships to it. Um, and I think there's something that came out of the discussion earlier about when we, when we kind of play musical chairs with our relational universes, then it becomes really problematic. But when we manage to find situations where we actually just add more chairs um, to that activity rather than take, take them away, then actually interesting and new opportunities arise. So yeah, hopefully we will all find ways, continue to find ways to, to help grow the relational universes, um, both for ourselves and um, for the people that are important to us. So thanks very much for, for all your contributions. Thanks for everything that you're posting. Um, we will post the recording of this uh, sometime soon, whenever I get around to it, uh, really. Um, and um, hopefully see you again next time on the 23rd of November, I want to say, where we'll be exploring the learning zone model next. Um, and then again on the 14th of December, where we'll be exploring the role of critical reflection. So we've got the, the rest of the year planned out and I'm sure we'll be on to uh, further webinars, uh, webinar themes in the future for 2021 as well. Thanks very much for joining us.